Many civilians seeking to flee the fighting frequently come under fire. This woman was injured while attempting to escape with her son from West Mosul, where the battle continues to rage. Medical facilities also come under attack. Ahmed, who was wounded in an explosion near his house, had to flee from the bombing of the hospital where he had been taken for treatment. Ah, ya Allah. Babul Mustashfa. Ana bil Mustashfa. Madaniin. Udawash. Ma wal bidam. Tul ya bal la natla Mustashfa. Jabu li sidi wa falat. Wa sa ma sa. Ahmed is now being treated at the MSF medical facility in East Mosul, a few kilometers from the front line. The inhabitants of East Mosul are gradually returning to their homes, but many of them, wounded during the fighting, are unable to resume their previous lives, like people who've had emergency surgery but still need post-operative care. <laughs> يربطوا لك العصب مع رجلك يسووا لك عمليات التحسني عندك هذا القدم ما تقدر تحركين ان هاي يعني قاعيه مع القدم على المستقبل يحطوا لك يعني مثل نقول هيك عمل يعني قاعيه يعني عمل تا تقدر تنهضين الحركه مع رجلك ما اعرف جابوني هنا كل اربع ايام خمسه يسووني عمليه كل اربع ايام خمسه يسووني عمليه ما جاد يعني بس هل يعني شويه MSF opened this facility in March. It has an emergency room, surgical theatre and a 30-bed inpatient department. The vast majority of patients have war wounds. Imagine you've been wounded in the fighting that happens near the front line or in West Mosul at the moment and you've been stabilized. You maybe even received a first line emergency surgical intervention and now you're walking with a piece of shrapnel or a bullet or a foreign body inside of you. Uh, you don't require any life-saving emergency treatment but you still have something that prevents you from leading a normal life. Since opening the facility, MSF has given over a thousand emergency consultations and performed more than 175 surgeries. As people gradually return to East Mosul, medical needs in this part of the city are set to increase still further. The team is currently extending its inpatient capacity by adding 20 more beds. After fighting broke out last November, PK3 camp was set up to provide protection to civilians fleeing their homes. Eight months later, the 3,000 initially expected have risen to 25,000. New arrivals are putting up makeshift shelters, but they're not receiving basic necessities such as plastic sheeting and soap. Overcrowding, lack of water, makeshift shelters, all these factors foster the spread of epidemics. Nous sommes en période de pic pali, ce qui fait que les enfants sont régulièrement malades et nous sommes obligés d'ouvrir une clinique mobile pour soigner les enfants de moins de 15 ans. Les conditions de vie ici sont déplorables parce qu'il n'y a pas suffisamment de latrines, il n'y a pas suffisamment d'eau. On crée une épidémie et liée au manque d'eau. The teams are improving the camp's water supply. In a situation where there's not enough humanitarian aid to respond to needs, an epidemic could fast become unmanageable. Hakobian has a drug-resistant form of tuberculosis. He's been on treatment for 16 months. They are tuberculosis for human. They are admitted to the nail and naum. They are the lobby bolor organ nail and naum. And he does do men. He does do the lujamanang. He's got sinor. They are 
Gebatitionen. Hakobian was able to benefit from the new generation of hepatitis C drugs, direct acting antivirals. Three months on, the virus was no longer detected in his blood. He still has to wait for a second test to confirm he's cured. Tous les patients qui ont été mis sous traitement ont jusqu'à maintenant, et le programme vient simplement de commencer, eu des résultats très positifs et ont très bien supporté, avec très très peu d'effets secondaires, ces nouveaux traitements. Just a short time ago, Hakobian was suffering from two very serious infections, neither of which could be treated properly. The treatment he took for hepatitis C appears to have been successful. And he's taking Bedaquilin, a new drug for drug-resistant TB, which has greatly increased his chances of survival. You're a water and sanitation expert, and MSF has just sent you to Sana'a, the capital of Yemen. First, you meet with the head of mission who puts you in the picture. Suspected cholera cases have just been reported in a town in Amran Governorate. Your task is to set up a 50-bed cholera treatment center, or CTC for short. Once you get there, you'll have three days to get the center up and running. You set off immediately, with this truck transporting the six tons of supplies and equipment you'll need. A site's been found near the town's health centre. How can this empty space be converted into a CTC? First, it needs to be divided up into four areas. Three for patient observation, hospitalisation and recovery. The fourth area is for staff only. To pass from one area to another, you'll need to set up different circuits. One for patients and their caregivers, one for staff, one for waste management, and one for the handling of corpses. Everyone entering and exiting a CTC goes through a disinfection area. A guard will spray chlorinated water onto the soles of people's feet or shoes as they go in and out. People must wash their hands too. Make sure chlorinated water is available to do so. You'll also need plastic sheeting to cover the ground in the patient tents. It needs to be regularly cleaned using a chlorine solution. Now for the beds. You'll use specialised beds with holes in them for severely dehydrated patients too weak to get up. Place buckets next to each bed as cholera patients suffer from vomiting and diarrhoea. There also needs to be something to hang a saline drip. Drips are not required in the observation and recovery tents where patients need just oral rehydration salts mixed with water. The staff area will be used to store supplies. CTCs demand a lot of medical supplies and equipment. These include the famous oral rehydration salts, but also chlorine, IV equipment, buckets, and so on. You'll also need to organize water supply. CTCs use huge quantities of water, water that has to be chlorinated to avoid risk of contamination. It's also where staff prepare the chlorine solutions. Depending on what it's for, cleaning floors, spraying feet, washing hands or the handling of corpses, different concentrations are made up and used in specific areas in the centre. Lastly, you'll have to install latrines and hand washing points, which help prevent the spread of cholera. Because you have two objectives, to provide care to patients, but also to contain the epidemic. And it doesn't end there. Your teams will visit the whole area treating water sources, raising awareness to the disease, and implementing hygiene measures in homes and public spaces. Fulfilling all of the above and complying with a range of stringent procedures are as crucial in Yemen now as they are during any other cholera outbreak. Ceux qui n'ont pas les moyens ou ceux qui n'ont pas de chance, ils vont se faire pendant plusieurs semaines ou plusieurs mois emprisonnés. On va les obliger à travailler sans être rémunérés. Ils vont être gardés dans des conditions de vie exécrables, pires que celles des centres de détention. Et un nombre assez important d'entre eux vont mourir. 
tout ce passage-là dans le désert avant d'arriver sur la côte euh, est assez mal connu. Euh, mais les indications qu'on a pour l'instant semblent montrer qu'il y a au moins autant de morts dans le désert euh, que sur la Méditerranée. C'est évidemment des circonstances très difficiles pour une organisation humanitaire euh, que d'assister euh, ces gens-là qui vivent dans la clandestinité totale sous la coupe de réseaux mafieux extrêmement violents. On continue d'essayer d'avoir accès à cette population et en attendant, euh, on s'occupe euh, d'assister les personnels qui ramassent les corps euh, et qui essayent de les identifier avant de les enterrer dignement. C'est un processus euh, assez long euh, puisque ces migrants qui se retrouvent jetés euh, littéralement euh, sur les escaliers de la morgue euh, chaque matin euh, n'ont pas de papier sur eux. Et donc ces procédures, euh, d'une part, prennent très longtemps, les corps restent trop longtemps à la morgue et souvent sont, euh, se concluent par un échec. Et donc ces gens-là qui ont vécu l'enfer, qui ont échoué et qui sont morts, euh, meurent de façon anonyme. On veut s'occuper des morts pour augmenter les chances de ces pauvres gens euh, qui ont tout tenté pour rejoindre l'Europe et qui ont échoué, qui sont morts dans le désert, pour augmenter les chances qu que leur nom soit connu, qui ne meurent pas totalement anonymes et qui ne disparaissent pas dans les vents du désert, comme ça, que leur sort soit connu de leur famille, de leurs autorités et de l'humanité euh, au sens large. L'idée que euh, des populations importantes euh, disparaissent de la Terre sans que leur nom euh, n'apparaisse plus jamais, c'est quelque chose qui euh, heurte mon sens de l'humanitaire.